I want to hear some few quick answers to this question. If green buildings can get us to carbon neutrality, what is left to be done to sustain life? Some key phrases. Obviously, we're not, we could spend hours downloading this. Air quality, for, water quality, for sure. Food, water, waste management, habitat, biodiversity. OK. A big list. Notice the big list? The big list, I'm going to stop here. The big list will never get us there. So we'll talk about that in a minute. So that might stir you up a little bit. Let's keep going. Confucius advised us that if we hope to repair what is wrong in the world, we'd best start with the rectification of the names. The corruption of society begins with the failure to call things by their proper names, and its renovation begins with the reattachment of real meaning to precise concepts. So what about that word sustainability? <laughs> oh, <there's, laughs> what about that word? How many of us are doing sustainable buildings? Not. <laughs> None of us are, and yet we use that term. Jonathan Port's definition of sustainability I particularly like in this instance. If you can do it forever, it's sustainable. If you can't, it isn't. So now let's take the extremes. You know, we can actually illustrate things by taking wide extremes. Um, imagine 100 million lead platinum buildings sprinkled over the earth. Do we have a sustainable planet? Imagine 100 million living buildings sprinkled around the Earth. Do we have a sustainable planet? OK, something's wrong with our use of that word sustainability. I was talking to a guy at uh, one of the acad private academies in New England, and he said, we're sustainable. I said, really? How you wow, cool. How are you doing that? We have an endowment. <laughs> He's right. I couldn't argue with him, but it kind of misses the point. Because we all know in our hearts where we have to go. And yet, we feel ourselves constrained by how we see the world in holding ourselves back. So hopefully this talk today is going to give us some perspective. All right, where we're going, this is a little mind map. The, uh, here we are at conventional design. Randy Croxton says, we build our buildings just one step better than breaking the law. I happen to love that. <laughs> Any less, we'd be in jail. So we're at conventional design generally, and we go to green, 30% energy savings, 50% energy savings, and that would must mean, and we can do that for lots of other categories, water, toxicants, materials, that would mean that if 30% or 50% is good, zero has to be sustainable. As long as we're looking at it from a quantifiable perspective, it means we're working towards zero. That's why I asked that question in the beginning. Is carbon neutrality sufficient to sustain life? Easter Island, you're all familiar with the Easter Island story, right? Well, you know, that's an island that went extinct, and the big, massive icon heads on the island. It went extinct. It was a carbon neutral island. And we have a fundamental disaggregation uh, with life on this planet. So zero doesn't mean squat. Now, let me take that back. It's incredibly important. I like what Hunter Levin says, we need to buy time to figure this out, because we have unlearned so much of what maybe we knew as peoples, and we certainly know from history what we knew as peoples and how to live in relationship with all life, mutually beneficial relationship with all life. But if we try to solve it technically, we actually are taking little pieces. I'm going to take some water, some energy, a little bit of less poison over here, and we put it together, we put it in a pot and stir it, and we come out with a green building, and we pat ourselves in the back. Yep, we're doing sustainable buildings. We aren't. By the way, we're doing green buildings for sure. Or we're building buildings that have a tendency to lead us towards a sustainable condition. That's what we're doing, and we should be proud of that. But we also shouldn't rest on that. And I don't think any of us are here, so don't, I'm, not, I'm not dumping on you. I hope you don't get that impression. I just want to wake us up. So this is a, this is, this is a technical world. Pieces, uh, iPods, cool tubes. Waterless urinals, those are all important. And yet if we take a thousands of those pieces and try to add them together, do we have a sustainable condition? 
No, we don't, not yet, something's missing. Life, on the other hand, let's keep going, because right now we're at zero, uh, nature abhors a vacuum, we gotta work on a positive side. And that's living systems theory and thinking. Um, and that comes from patterns. We're gonna talk about that. That's primarily what we're talking about today, is how we actually work with life as a living organism. And we go to restoration and regeneration. And I'll talk about those two words because they mean two entirely different things. The thing is, we need both. We need to stop the damage. We need to do what LEED is doing and all these other rating systems out there. Incredibly important, but it's not sufficient. And in fact, if this was all we were talking about, because we know that, that you know, you've heard the expression sustainability is just a slower way to die, or building efficiency is just a slower way to die. <coughs> what we have to do is turn around. I like Bill McDonough's analogy. If you're in a car in Kansas, and you're driving towards Canada, but you really want to go to Mexico, if you slow down the car, will you get to Mexico any faster? <laughs> now, to carry that a little further, yeah, we do have to slow down the car to make the turn. So that's what we're doing, and what, towards what are we turning? And we actually need to be working with both the sides of this diagram. So life is a whole evolving system. If we are talking about, what are we talking about when we're talking about sustainability? Sustaining what? Life. life. Should we not know what life is? Do you see how quickly this gets into the metaphysical? Because if we're not answering that question, we're probably not going to solve it. Now I like what Humberto Maturana has as his definition for life, a Chilean biologist. Life is the process of becoming. I think it's so elegant. NASA has a definition on the, Regenesis, on the Genesis project, uh, it's a project to study out, uh, life on other planets, potentially, uh, out of the solar system. Life is imperfect replication. Perfect replication in that analogy is a, is a crystal. Imperfect repl repl replication is mutating, evolving, emerging life and potential. We don't solve for existence, we need to start solving for potential. So how do we do that? One thing is we can't keep doing this. Let's just take a list of the environmental imperatives. Okay, let's go back up a second. Let's talk about water for a second. This is a question that I ask every group I teach. Where do we get our drinking water? The sky. Can you drink the rain anymore, Vivian? It's better, but not yet. You can't drink the rain anymore. So there's a problem. Where do we get our drinking water? Okay, if the rain's dirty, how come the, how come the water's clean in the aquifers? Filtration. Filtration. Filtration through what? Love Canal Earth? <laughs> Pittsburgh Earth? <laughs> Sorry, it's true. Yeah. Uh, what kind of earth? Diatomaceous. That's, that's, <laughs> you're so full of BS, Dennis. <laughs> what kind of earth? You know, something, I know this is a little tricky, we're in a group, but unless we know this, I'm, I'm concerned that we don't know this, on, this cause happens everywhere this way. We need to know this stuff off the top of our heads. And, and who, Miss, Miss Vatch? Miss, yeah. Where's Miss Vatch? Doctor. Vatch. 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 Where is she? There she is. I loved her talk. So. Well, you're right on target, and um, uh, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm polishing the apple here. So, the pot so where do we get potable water? We get it through because of healthy soil, bears crapping in the woods, leaf duff, worms, microbes, dead animals decaying. All that stuff creates a collaborative web of life that, and I'm, you know, I'm being graphic because life is graphic. Get over it. It is. We kind of shove life aside. Ooh, ick nature, ick. Um, so water, that dirty water falls through, it cleans it up for us, it puts us in the ground, and we have fresh water. Now, therefore, let's play the systems game, because this is, as Richard said, this is about systems thinking, deep systems thinking. It's about connecting, and systems thinking is pretty simple. The hip bones connected to the thigh bones, connected to the shin bone. There, there's systems thinking. It's how you connect the pieces. So what on this list is connected to potable water? 
everything. You see that? Okay, what's, what on this list is connected to global warming? Everything. Any questions on that? <coughs> By the way, and you can quite, just raise your hand if you think uh, you have a question. But so the point of this is, is that all of these are a whole. And when we decide to select pieces of life and vote on them, like with lead, oh, I'm going to be a lead silver. You know, I just can't, I can't deal with life. I'm just going to deal with materials. That basically is saying you don't get it. And this is where lead sends the wrong signal. Now, lead sends the right signal about market transformation. It is sending the wrong signal about what it means to think as a whole system. You can't vote on nature. You can't decide what's in or out. Stormwater management, nah, that's out. I don't like it. So pieces of green do not equal sustainability. There's no such thing as sustainable paint or sustainable waterless urinals or sustainable brick. And now people are using the term regenerative, regenerative block. You'll see people using our stuff on their websites. They're doing regenerative cement block. What the heck? I don't know. So. A system. Here are the first two definitions of a system. Do you know that there's a third? Anybody know the third aspect of a system? It's subtle. It's really important. Nope. It's close. No, well, inevitably. There's a third definition to a system. Yeah, OK, I'll, I'll take the suspense away. Elements. In interrelationship, it's all about relationships. Life is about relationship. You don't exist without other things around you and, and entities. So it's all about relationships, it's all about systems. The third aspect is every system has to have a purpose. If you don't know what the purpose is, how are you going to work with it? So let's imagine having a bunch of these, you're from another planet, and there's all these parts of a bicycle sitting on the table in front of you. How are you going to put it together? You have to know its purpose to even begin to understand it. Now, I'm setting you up here for moving into living systems. So we know that leads, to, so there's a purpose. A system has to have a purpose. And a living system also has to have a purpose. So let's talk about that. This is a project in Idaho we were working on a few years ago. And the developer is putting up 1,000 homes on this 3,500-acre alluvial fan. You kind of cringe, right? Oh, gosh. So we get called to come in for these kind of things. He, he, he presented his development to the community, and the community went wild in their uh, negativity. And he said, well, we need some help. Can you come up and help us? Well, we say, well, we're not a shill for your development. You know, We'll help you if we think it's, it's, help, it's helpable. What we believe is that humans are part of nature. We're not inseparable. We have a right to be here. The problem is we don't have a right to be here as we are currently here. So what does it mean for humans to be part of nature? Is it possible to rethink this development? Now, if we go up here, and this is 3,500 acres. This is the Teton River. This is the Teton Valley. We're flying in a little plane over the Three Sisters and the Teton Range, looking southwest. These are the big whole mountains. All right. So first thing, first reaction is lead says you get what? A point for, for not getting rid of farmland. Now, that's a good idea except when the farmland is bad. And most farmland is bad. So why do we get a point for keeping bad farmland? Well, because we kind of, va well, food's good, right? Not the way we're producing food. We're destroying the earth in two ways. And we're destroying the earth on the two of the fundamental human requirements. Humans, hum all life needs nutrients, and all life needs shelter to process those nutrients and to nurture, at least mammalian life. And how are we killing the earth? Through our agricultural systems and our building systems. Now, the corollary also needs to be true. We need to be able to heal the earth through those processes. So what does that look like? How do we understand what's going on here instead of just piecemealing it and saying, well, agriculture is good, you get a point. So what we do is we look at the way life is working. And the life, it's a, if it's a system of life, it has a purpose. Now, our cosmology, and I don't think there are many that agree with this, our cosmology is, is that every, all life is an organism. Pittsburgh is a living organism. Your family is an organism. You are an organism. And you've got other organisms and suborganisms that are supporting each other. You've got universes in your body that are actually independent of your life, but supporting you. It's a nested system, all connected. 
how do and, that, and at this point are are the, you know the old Star Wars uh, uh, robot uh, or not Star Wars what was it uh, lost in space you know frying his brain because he couldn't compute all these complexities warning warning so we've got a lot of complexity going on here and I get people saying to me I can barely design an effective bathroom and you want me to talk about all this stuff now as architects we have an opportunity let me set this up for you as architects, I know there are, most people are policy people, we all do, no matter what walk of life, we have the opportunity to create larger than life, if you will, larger than our typical job description solutions. Our work should be acupuncture points to energize much deeper solutions. And the opportunity with building is to take this and say, how is life working? So let's talk about this. This, and let's also, uh, let me describe how, how this place worked. This place was formed by this creek coming out of the Big Hole Mountains called Mahogany Creek. The farmers who settled this area 100 years ago dammed it, and they took 90% of the water to irrigate these fields. Now you can see the remnant of this creek being shunted off to the side here. It barely has enough water to reach the Teton River. Can you see, now, can you see some ghost images on the screen? What are you seeing? Contours, for sure. Can you see the dendritic pattern? What was, yeah, it was an alluvial pattern. This alluvial fan was formed by this creek or creeks fire hosing alluvium over millennium. When the farmers came, they disconnected that connection. Now, you need to understand, just like there's a hydrological cycle, there's also a nutrient cycle. If we, if water was allowed to go to, to go downhill all the time, taking nutrients with it, we would live, literally be living on a rock right now, or we'd be swimming. But something works in opposition to that water going downhill and takes nutrients back uphill. What is it? What takes nutrients back uphill? Not a trick question. Huh? Animals. Animals, fish, birds, insects. Look at salmon going upstream and dying up there all those nutrients. They've had, they, uh, David Suzuki did a study, Scientific American reported on a study with a bear in Alaska. You take a bear, you remove, uh, and what the bear is doing is takes the salmon out of the stream, eats the salmon, uh, eats only the good parts because there's a lot of salmon to eat, and deposits the rest of the fish on the shore or in the, in the woods nearby, thereby nutrifying the forest floor. They did a study, they removed the bear from one watershed to test, well, is it the bear that's hurting the salmon? And they found out that within 18 months, the forest started to die. You're gonna hear this word 18 a lot, by the way. 18 months, the forest started to die. A, a, a Hebrew uh, calligrapher was in one of uh, a, a presentation I was making. He said, do you know what Hebrew means? You know what the word 18 in Hebrew means? Life. life. Hmm. I, don't know what you, I don't know what you're gonna do with that, but you might wanna do something with it. So. <laughs> All right, so this alluvial fan is, is formed by this creek, these creeks. So here's the soils map to show you the proof of that. There's the soils map. So we know that that was going on. Now, this land has a purpose. And when we figured this out, it took a few days worth, work, worth of work with a systems permaculture and system eco systems ecologists to want to run around the community and figure out what was going on here. What we found out is that without these creeks here anymore, the salmon no longer live there, the yellowtail cutthroat trout no longer live there, there were no beaver, otter, because we could read in old diaries that they were all there, moose, elk, deer, megafauna, and what those animals were doing was taking nutrients back upstream. When they flattened out this system, and you can see the remnants of the stream, and cut it off with farm fields, they actually cut off the nutrient cycle, thereby destroying three ecosystems. The Teton River, which is just about dead up here. The prairie savanna here, because this was a wood, woods and prairie. And the Big Hole Mountains are actually suffering because those nutrients aren't going back upstream. So if we're working on life, then let's work on life. And so we presented this finding to the developer and his design team, and they said, what did I say? Is that what you're laughing about? Wow. No. No, now here's the good story. The developer said, of course that's what's going on here. 
And within a half an hour, we redesigned that entire project. Now, can you imagine doing that under around a lead discussion? What happened is the developer got it because they had grown up hunting and fishing in here. And they said, you know what? That is what's going on here. And so as a result, all these thousand homes were compressed into very tight wedges. Even with a thousand homes, which will never be built, they would only use 10% of the water coming out of that stream. And, which would, and we established 1,500 foot right of ways, buffers, if you will, wilder, you know, wildland corridors for the animals to reestablish themselves. No dogs were allowed, no fences were allowed, no turf grass except for 500 square feet on each property. That was it. That basically set a pattern to begin to regenerate farming, wildlife, because you could do farming in this, but not this kind of farming, human habitat, and in a relationship to the whole, so that the ecosystem is actually being built back up. Does this make sense? Okay, not that hard, but what it does, it is hard because we don't think about land as an organism. But once you understand it's a system, a living system, it has a purpose. And you identify complexity. The way we hold complexities is not by gluing thousands of pieces together and expecting to understand it. We understand patterns, patterns of life. I don't understand Vivian because she has brown hair, she has, she's so many feet high, she weighs so many pounds, and she's wearing a red dress. That doesn't work to understand Vivian. And then I put all these in a couple livers, or liver and a couple kidneys. No, my, I'm an anonymous, right? You put, them in a, you put it in a pot and you say, there's Vivian. <coughs> Something's missing. The way you get to know Vivian is through her being as a whole organism. And we get to understand her essence, who she is, not just what she is. So what's the pattern on this graphic? I know some of you know this, and some of you have seen this talk before. So don't answer, but hold your, hold your enthusiasm. What's the pattern? Fifteen seconds. Yeah? See, you're on to something. OK. Stand up and say that. Bellow it. Curved versus angular. OK. That wasn't bellowed, but I'll bellow for you. The bottom line has curved elements. The top line has straight elements. How many got that? It's about right. Two out of, about two out of 100 get this. Now, but now do you all see that pattern? How many of you see it now? OK. Patterns are powerful. Look at this, we're all agreeing about a pattern. But if we had a list of 300 points that we had to go after, we'd be here forever arguing about them. Bicycle racks, no. Stormwater management, green roofs, waterless urinals, no waterless urinals. So we'd have those, that kind of discussion, and it would go on forever. Now, we have to get to that level. But if we can get at it from a purpose, of, from a principle of life, and understand from the way life is working and wants to work in that place, then the criteria that we use is going to come automatically out of that. Do you see that? I mean, this is pretty important. Do you, I mean, really, do you see that? OK. Now, if you don't, I want to hear that too. OK. A whole new mind is needed, or a way to process. We're very good and we're taught in our schools, and I've been perverted, and we probably all have, by a, a, a fragmented, piecemeal view of the world, a reductionist view of the world. Am I right? So it's very hard for us to get out of that mental model. Have, you many, have any of you read Jill Bolte Taylor's My Stroke of Insight, or seen her TED Talk? Brain scientist who had a brain had an aneurysm in her left hemisphere, and her, her death, which she describes, she obviously didn't, but almost, she described how her left hemisphere shut down and all her activities shifted into her right hemisphere, and she saw the world in a literally whole different way. She saw no, no law, in the right hemisphere we don't see boundaries, we see relationships. She was able to see the world as a whole, and she saw it, she was so blissed out, she said, I'm ready to check out, this is great. <laughs> but something pulled her back. And uh, oh, there was an article in the New, York, um, New Yorker in July 2008 called The Eureka Hunt, and a brain surgeon talked about the, the same kind of thing. And he said, if you have a stroke in your right hemisphere, we tell you you're lucky because we don't know what the right hemisphere does anyway. Now, that's a quote. <laughs> now, this is our medical, this, hey, wait a minute. This is our Western medical profession. And we believe our doctors, 
No, I'm serious. We believe our doctors? Holy moly. So we got some learning to do. We need to use both hemispheres. Both are important. The elemental mind, that left hemisphere, works on a resting disorder. And that's primarily what the Green Building Movement has been talking about. Minimize impact, <laughs> problem solve, restore to the original. By the way, can you restore to the original? How come? There, there isn't one. Why? Well, no, not, now, a lot of people don't believe that. Why isn't there one? It's always changing. It's always changing. It's called evolution. It happens. And if you don't believe in evolution, just call it change. Are we different in Pittsburgh than we were in 1850? Okay, call it change. You don't have to call it evolution. Um, above this line, though, we, so this is, this is prevention, but above this line, we had this ideal version of sustainability. We know in our hearts we're going somewhere. The thing is, we need to be working on that intentionally. The ancient peoples could see relationships, not just things. And that gave them the ability to participate in enabling greater potential. You've heard the term emergence, call it evolution. You heard the term development. You know what the word development really means? I used to hate the word development until I understood what it really means. The word development does not mean to occupy the land. It means to create new potential. And if you look closely, it's a synonym for what? Evolution. Oh my goodness, this is terrible, all these things that are coming at us. All right. Contemporary Indians often use the word wilderness as a negative label for land that has not been taken care of by humans for a long time. Wow. You know, it's a <laughs> I love it. This is, I got to know why I'm funny. I, or was it pathetic? I All right. So it's a great book <laughs> by Kat Anderson. It was her thesis project at Berkeley. On 90% of the state of California was a managed ecosystem before Europeans got there. Also, the Northeast United States, from North Carolina to Newfoundland, was a managed ecosystem before Europeans got here. And we had the arrogance of Europeans to say, huh, these savages, they don't know what they're doing. In fact, they knew, they knew a lot what they were doing. They didn't know everything, but they knew a lot what they were doing with the land. This is, a, this is the Willow School. This is the site of the Willow School before we started design. It's a beech maple forest. In the, before the Europeans got here, this is what that forest looked like. William Penn wrote in his diaries, you could drive a four-in-hand wagon, a four-horse wagon, through the woods of New Jersey and Pennsylvania and not hit a tree. Like a Robin Hood movie out of Hollywood. Succulents on the ground. And what was going on is the natives are accustomed to set fire of the country in all places where they come and burn it twice a year, in the spring and fall of the leaf. It's a 1600s diary, not my spelling. So what was happening, this was a managed ecosystem, and what was happening is the, the, that forest, those woods, were a chestnut, hickory, oak forest, thick bark trees. And when they burned these cold fires every spring and fall, it killed the thin bark beeches and maples. But beaches and maples will take over an ecosystem if allowed to. And within 50 years, this forest became a beech maple forest. And then we look at this and we say, wow, that's green. Yeah, it's green, but it isn't, it isn't productive. And in fact, those plants are struggling. It's oversimplified. It's less diverse. It's less resilient. And it's a flattened, dying ecosystem. And we say, it's, but it's green. And we save the trees. We're not understanding our role. When we, when we garden, and we pinch a rosebud or prune an apple tree, what are we doing to that plant? Selecting. And we're doing that. But we're also, what's the actual activity going on in the plant itself once we prune it? Stimulating. Cur stimulating it. We're actually adding energy to its roots, which allows it to, be, to actually thrive and survive. So right now, these trees are also trying to struggle to reach towards the sky and actually trying to outcompete each other. We have a role, just like the tick bird on the back of a rhinoceros has, the, has a role, or a honeybee has a role. We have a role, and we have to figure that out again. How do we take care of life? Aboriginal peoples, I'm sorry, I've got to read this. This is really important. Aboriginal peoples believe that when humans are gone from an area long enough, they lose the practical knowledge about correct interaction, and the plants and animals retreat spiritually from the earth 
or hide from humans. When intimate interaction ceases, the continuity of knowledge passed down through generations is broken, and the land becomes wilderness. The idea that we put wilderness in a park is absurd. Now, I'm glad the park system exists, because we don't know what we're doing right now. But the park, here's what we're saying with the park system. Nature, we don't know what you're doing. So we're going to put you in this pen and put a fence around you and pat you on the head and say, you go figure it out, because we don't get it, and we're going to go out here and screw it up. That's what we're saying with the concept of the park system. So how do we shift to bringing sanctuary to everywhere we live? Now, even New York City is a sanctuary for certain species. The peregrine falcons have figured out that New York City is a great canyon lands. I was on the 40th floor of one office building and I saw this poof of feathers right out of my peripheral vision as some falcon hit a pigeon. Uh, hunting, hunting season's up. So something's working there. And that, I'm just taking that as an extreme analogy is that life works and life will seek life. Now, restoration. So this is, um, uh, this is a stream, this is a civil engineer's view of a stream in Baltimore, Maryland. <laughs> Isn't that about right? By the way, the civil engineer who did this stream was in a talk I gave two years ago, and he was wildly angry. <laughs> when I made that comment. And, I, and but he, didn't, he was so mad he didn't listen to what I was saying because I was giving him a big out. Because what was going on here is that we work with pieces, and he was given the job to stop the eroding soils because north of here were buildings and parking lots, and those parking lots were, were flashing water, so, you know, at heavy rain events, the water would be roaring down the stream, rip up soil, and pollute the, um, uh, the, basically the Chesapeake Bay. So his job was to get rid of the soil pollution. And he said, but we got all this water coming off the parking lots and buildings. They said, that's not your job. Your job is to take care of this stream. And by the way, that's one of the biggest problems we have in our, sorry to Dennis, one of the biggest problems we have in our society is that we differentiate what our job is. All of our jobs are to take care of life. And my job is to take care of the stream. No, the only way that I can take care of the stream because it's a living entity is to look at how it's connected and its role in the larger system. There's no such thing as a boundary on your site. And if anybody's doing a green building and does property boundaries and stops it there, you ought to be shot. I mean, we do it in the, look at our weather maps, right? The United States, Canada, and Mexico don't exist. I mean, that gives you the kind of idea of how we think. So, by the way, and I appreciate uh, um, Miss Fatch? Fathis, Miss Fathis. Um, the point about the watershed in our, in our world is the smallest unit of design. Because a watershed is what activates life. The Spanish say, agua is viva. Water is life. Therefore, we need to be working with it if we're working on sustainability. So we need to be working on a watershed. So, so he's basically to restore the stream. So he put, made the stream concrete, which of course killed everything. No more fish, no more gravel to, for the fish to spawn in. Uh, the trees were gone away so that uh, there was heat overkill, no trout would survive. Uh, no fish or microbes to eat the debris, so they had to get a back hose to take it out. A cascadingly worse system. Unintended consequences. When you work on solving one thing in a non-integrated fashion, we end up with unintended consequences. That's the biggest problem. That's why we can't do just PV panels or just um, lead buildings. It has to be a system. So three years later, though, they, they finally, Maryland started their stormwater management laws, and that allowed this to be looked at as a system. And they held back the water on the upper buildings and parking lots, and three years later, this is what this stream looks like. Kind of cool, right? I mean, we know about restoration. We know it's possible. The point about restoration is that restoration is not restoring something to its original condition. Here's what restoration means. Restoration means restoring a subsystem, wetland, stream, riparian, uh, beach dune system, a subsystem so, so that it has the self-organizing capability to evolve. That's what restoration means. Now. What we're doing with regeneration is taking it a step further. Regeneration is not looking at the stream and saying, let's restore it. Regeneration is looking at all the dimensions of life and saying, let's restore them in parallel. Whoa. That gets a little woo-woo at that point. 
So let's show you how it works. This is the beginning of a restoration project. I know a lot of you have seen this example, but it's still really compelling because it starts getting into the idea of how patterns work. This is a ranch northeast of Santa Fe, New Mexico, 400 acres. Not, water has not been present on this land in recorded memory. A guy bought it, bought the ranch. He uh, planted native species. He got rid of the grazing animals. He put gabions in the arroyos to stop the erosion because it does snow and rain in this area, about 12 to 10 to 12 inches a year. Called it a day because nature knows what it's doing. We don't. He then heard of Bill Mollison and the permaculture crew. They were over here with our company working um, a number of years ago. And he invited them up. And in the space of three days, they did this evaluation. They looked at meteorological, geological and cultural history. And why cultural? Because humans are part of nature. So geologically, or meteorologically, 10 inches of rain, 12, 10 to 12 inches of rain, 100 inches of evaporation, a desert. No surprise, it's that way today. Geologically, they took sample, soil samples underneath uh, in these stream beds, and they found underneath just a couple inches of dirt was rich humus that could only have been formed at the bottom of ponds in the desert. So that was a head scratcher. Uh, culturally, you go way beyond the site, no boundaries. Found out in Durango, Colorado, there were diaries talking about Bill Williams and his mountain men coming south to trap, what do you think? Beaver in the desert. Some, somebody said sand beaver? <laughs> no, no such thing as sand beaver. So the first reaction is, let's bring back the beaver. Beaver don't live on swarrow cactus and prickly pear and yucca. So that's not going to work. But what is a pattern? What is the pattern of beaver? What do beaver do? Make habitats. So what do those habitats do? Uh, what was that? Tree shade. Tree shade. They dam up the water. They're primarily dam builders. Part of their habitat. When they build dams, what happens? Well, they said, we don't know, but let's figure it, let's try to do it, because the beaver must have known what they were doing. They couldn't bring back beavers, so they put up a dozen meter high earthen check dams where beaver would logically have built their dams, and within how many months? 18. 18. <laughs> True. There was a permanent running stream on this site. That seem mysterious? Does that seem pretty cool? <laughs> pretty cool to me. Um, Notice they went beyond the site into the water set into the cultural region to figure this out. So how come the water came back? It's a great riddle, and I gave you all the clues. Water, it does snow and rain, but it sheets off. And it, it's the desert, so it evaporates very, poof, it evaporates very quickly. But if you have dams to hold back the water, the water has a chance to pond behind the dams. And with ponded water, it has a chance to saturate the groundwater table. And you keep doing that, and the groundwater table is going to rise to create a stream. a stream. Voila, a stream that they didn't even know they could create. Now, what makes this regenerative is that every farmer, now regeneration has two meanings. Regeneration means to create a new, and I think this fits into that category. It also means, interestingly enough, this is a little woo-woo here, it means to be born of a new spirit. It was actually a term used in the Church of England 400 years ago for repentance, interestingly enough. So what makes this regenerative is not only creating this thing anew, is that every farmer down the valley was inspired, inspirited, here we go again, um, to create a new way of looking at life. And now there's a raging, frothy stream where there was no water 200 years ago. Now that's beginning to look at the Earth as a co-participant. And that's what we're talking about. How do we heal the planet? I believe that if we had our act together with will, if we all had the will, because that's all we need is will. We have the technologies. We don't need new technologies. I don't need another iPod. If we had the will, we could heal the Earth in 18 months. How's that for a challenge? I think we could. Alan Savory's work, he won the Buckminster Fuller Prize this year. Um, same thing, Zimbabwe. Here's what it was in 2004. After rainfall failure, one good year of rain, severe rainfall failure, but look at the, at the savanna coming back. And the reason he did that is that he stopped penning cat, cattle in, and he observed how cattle worked. Most people say cattle shouldn't be in the desert, and that's generally what I believe. 
But he said if you actually move the cattle like they do in the normal grazing patterns, they're moving every seven days. And when they leave the footprint in the soil, they become rain pockets. They hold the rain and they're seed, not destroyed, and the seeds grow. That's all it takes, is observing how life wants to work. Stop thinking about PV panels only and start looking at life too. I'm not saying don't think about PV panels, think about life too. Now at this point, somebody says, and I'm curious if anybody's thinking this, who gives us the right to decide how nature works? Anybody thinking that? A couple people, yeah. I mean, it's a fair question. I would turn that question around, though. In fact, I will turn that question around and say, who gives us the right to ignore how we're destroying it? Because that's what we're doing. Every square meter on this planet has been affected by us. Every square meter. They found some Iron Age smoke under many feet of ice in Greenland. We impact the planet no matter what we do. So instead of impacting it just negatively, how do we turn around and impact it positively? Is that getting at your question a little bit? I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, I, right. So I'm not sure I believe in, in the forest and garden, you know, or, or have believed it. But. Well, you know, so here's the point, and I think that's a good point. There's not just one belief here. It's not one or the other. It's not either or. It's both and. There are some places that should be left to wilderness. We should not be there. And there are many places we should be there. Lebanon was a forest at one time. So was Israel. How come that went downhill? Because we forgot about it. We, we, did, we forgot how to. There are, and I, really, if we had all afternoon, we could tell you the stories about what's going on in the world. This is not unusual. We just aren't paying attention from a building point of view. Uh, citrus, dates are being grown at 400 feet below sea level with no additional water. How is that possible? Let me assure you, it is. Because if we think about the way life wants to work, not how we think it works. This is happening all over the world. Can we use our buildings as an opportunity, as an acupuncture point? What is our role and purpose in sustaining life? Inhabit the earth, don't occupy it. That's a big difference. I think that's a Wendell Berry expression. We can no longer afford to be occupants of the earth. We need to be inhabitants again. From living lightly on the land to live fully with the land. We have to learn different things. We cannot care about pieces only. You can't, just can't care about your part. Nimbyism, that's the big problem with nimbyism. I only care about this issue. All of you can. Repurpose our role as humans. What is our role as humans? We still have to figure that out. But that's, a re that's probably the most important mission that we can get on get to. And build the mind that can see life's development and our role within it. Now let's use this word development for a second. Let's just try it. OK, go back to your groups again. Turn in your chairs. I'm going to ask you two questions. Imagine yourself building a new middle school. Somebody's buzzing over here. I mean, imagine yourself building a new middle school. Are you with your groups? Is it yours? Oh. What do you have to do? Ignore Vivian. <laughs> imagine yourself building a new middle school. What do you have to do? to achieve, to realize that middle school. Quickly, this is not hard, but, well it is hard actually, but what do you have to do? You've got 10 seconds. I wanna hear, shout, shout out loud, that's to me. Hey, 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 I, I wanna hear, one, one at a time, We're, you're, gonna talk with about, you're gonna talk amongst your group about the next question, sorry. I wasn't clear, talk to me. Purpose and function, okay, you gotta know that, what else? Uh, bonding, what else? Huh? Location, yeah, that's a good one. You gotta hire the architect. That's right. no, the team. The team. Ah, okay. All right. <laughs> Community buy-in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we, we get all that, right? Now let's shift the question to a systems question. Imagine yourself designing this middle school for your new new middle school for your school district for the purpose of developing the children in that school. Does that shift a little bit? Okay, now that's what I want you to talk about. And you got a couple minutes, but I wanna hear about the issues that you're gonna to have to address for the best development of those children. Okay, now you can talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Any insights or ahas in your discussion? I just wanna hear them, don't worry if you.
Cool. Good. Everybody hear that? Have a charrette and interview the students. Welcome the students as part of the participation, right? What else? That's it? The school has to nurture the child. Not just the building, but the environment that you're building, the, the land. The environment you're building, the land. The whole process. Yep, yep. So it's outside the building at that point, right? Okay. How the school can strengthen the community by versa. How, how the what? School can strengthen the community? Great, yep. What, what are the values and what is it we're trying to instill? And how do we make that sustainable, integrated component of Okay, what are the values? What are we trying to instill? That needs to be part of this dialogue and design process, right? The linking principles through physical place or through watershed or outdoor. The, the linking principles, how we're in relationship with all these living things at the Vivian, is that what you're saying? Okay, great. You talked about teaching the students about life and how they impact it. So if they touch a material, what happens to it? Yep, beautiful. Everybody hear that? Students to, teaching the students about life and how they impact it and how they interact with it. Okay, did anybody go the other way? We were going, everybody was going out. Did anybody go inward? <coughs> Curious. Yeah, exactly. Powers of 10, Vivian says. So let me tell you what we had at one group. One guy said, you know, I'm pretty screwed up. And until I'm working on my own development, how can I presume to work on the kids' development? Is that a fair comment? Are we all a little screwed up? I think that's fair. There may be some exceptions in here, but I'm not one of them. So this is both an inner and an outer. And let me uh, outer approach. If we're actually working on development, let me give you a. Ha and at this point, people will really start shutting down. Hold on, you don't have to shut down. Anymore. All right. So here's a diagram. Uh, we, I use this example with family and children, but you've got you, you have the school or your family or whatever group you're working with, and you have the larger socio-ecological system you're working within. Unless you're working at all those dimensions, you're probably going to fall flat. And, and how the heck do we do that? Let me give you two examples of what's going on in this. The first one is uh, the Brattleboro Food Co-op in Brattleboro, Vermont. And um, this is more of an outward journey. But we were called to do a lead gold grocery store in Brattleboro, Vermont with the Brattleboro Food Co-op. They're the, one of the second biggest industry in the Brattleboro, Vermont. It's actually a pretty amazing place. So they wanted a lead gold grocery store. And we say, do you want lead or do you want to do sustainability? Some people say, well, what does that mean? But they knew. They said, no, no, we, want, we know what lead is. We want a sustainable condition. All right. Let's, let's have a talk then. So I went up and met with the executive committee. We did a little research as a company about food systems, because I didn't know a whole lot about food systems. And so with the first, before we started our meeting, we took the executive committee on a tour of the grocery store. And we turned over apples from New Zealand, strawberries from California, and blueberries from Chile. And the president of the co-op said, you know, I think there's tofu from Burma in here somewhere. <laughs> So the question to them was, what happens if there's a trucker's strike? Are you a sustainable grocery store? Nope. So that's why you see this picture here. It's not a grocery store. It's a food system. And unfortunately, you see there's these hard boundaries here. That's not our fault. It's just New Hampshire's over there. It, it does exist. So this grocery store been working with the group, was programmed to become an agricultural and soil extension service to teach people how to farm again. Not one of those farms is active. The watershed is dying, the soil, the water's polluted, the soil is, over, is, is flattened out from many areas of extraction. Um, the best soil was in downtown Brattleboro, and somebody said, well, we built there, and this is our either-or culture. Well, mm, yes, you built there, but you're only covering 35% of the land. Where did most towns feed themselves in World War II? Victory gardens. They work. So the best soil is there. Can we start there? So that's why this became an agricultural and soil extension service, to teach people how to grow their own food again. It became a credit union to start the operation of getting, getting people to buy farms again. A forest service extension to begin to work on the for health of the forest. 
a cannery so the people could, plant, could can their own food, a place for hunters to dress their meat, a daycare center to take care of the kids. Uh, did I say credit union? I think I did. And um, oh, and by the way, a grocery store. So we made this presentation to the board. We've been working with the executive committee, and we didn't have a whole lot of money, so we made the presentation to the board. And one guy on the board said, all I wanted was a grocery store. <laughs> what is this? And we made a fundamental error, which is an error we continually make because of the, the, the pressures of money, but we weren't able to engage the community in a co-discovery process. And we've hit our, our head at our knee against that table low table an awful lot, and we're just finally realizing we cannot not work that way. We have, it's an integrated process, and people hold the relationships. If we're not engaging the people about these relationships, they're abstract. So it's integrating the people who hold those relationships so they can actually own those relationships and begin to sponsor them together, because that's the role of people, is to begin to start assembling these as a whole. Now, we left in kind of a funk, and, they call, and I, I just talked to the, the uh, past president two weeks ago, because we're kind of kind of check up on our clients and we want to see how they did. And Does it still make sense? It's kind of a risky thing. Uh, do you like what we did? No. <laughs> well, he said, he, basically, they called, they, we had this report, let me, I'll do a diversion here. We left that report with them. Well, actually, we had to write a report because they called the triple train wreck with no casualties, our meeting with them, our meetings with them. And they laugh about it now. They were not laughing about it then. And because it was way over the top for them, way over the top for the board. The executive council got it, but the rest of the people didn't. And that's why this whole uh, buy-in process is really important. And so we left. We realized we had to leave them with a report. And we spent 20000 extra dollars writing a very detailed report. You can read it on our website. And they, Vermonters, are frugal. I lived there for a while. I know that. And they read that. They were going to get something out of that damn report. They read that report for a year. And we got a call a year later saying, thank you, Bill. We want, to, we want to apologize to you. This is the best thing that's ever happened to us. And we see this a lot. Now, let me give you, unfortunately, this is not easy work. What's the hardest thing for humans to do? <laughs> What's this work about? Change. It's hard. There's a Harvard study years ago that talks about it requires a year for synapses to shift and three years for them to shift permanently. The Tibetans have a, um, a similar uh, tradition or knowledge base. They say 300 days and 1,000 days. Pretty interesting. We find that about a third of our clients are so, uh, what's the best word, twisted as a result of this work process with them. They say, oh, we don't get it. Every single, and, they, and, and about a third of them have let us go after about three months. In other words, being fired. <laughs> However, I don't use that word anymore because every one of them, and this is what's interesting, every one of them has called us back a year later and said, we get it. Now that's an interesting business plan model. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, uh, you know, it's just working out that way. All right, so you see what happens when you work outwards. So the role of the grocery store has become that. And now I just talked to, to Mark Goring, the president, two weeks ago, because we're getting a film done about this work. And he said, well, I want to do with this filmmaker is stand in front of the grocery store and tell the world the building doesn't matter. That's pretty cool. And of course it matters. It's the catalyst. But he said what was important is how we learn to take care of each other in the system. And he meant by each other, all life. So that's a powerful regeneration story. That's what we're talking about with regeneration. And unless we're working at that level of cohesion and coherence, we're actually sl slumming it. All right, the Willow School. You saw some references to that before. Willow, the Willow School, and Marcus has been involved with this, is a 10-year-old project. We're on the third phase now. And uh, you can see no grass, and we're teaching the faculty how to um, uh, teach about systems. Because they don't know. The five-year-olds know instantly. The teachers take years to figure it out. That's, it's a true statement, by the way. Um, and we have edible gardens, education, yada, yada. Uh, kids are, their curriculum is based on place, everything that's in their place. Their social studies, their watershed, their physics, their math, their art are all based on place and values. We're on, this is the second phase. Uh, I see the garden in the background. OK, now there's the third phase coming up. A year and a half ago, 
I happened to be visiting with Mark Bedron, and this is not telling tales out of school, this is all very public. I was sitting in, in um, a living room with Mark Bedron, talking about one of his children, the problems they were having, and it was really wonderful to hear the way it brought their family together. And they were learning so many things about each other, how to be in a relationship in a responsible way. And I said to Mark, so why don't we do that on the design team? That's a good idea. So that filtered for a while. And what Mark came back with, he said, you know, I'm so tired of people blaming each other for this and that. And Mark is a contractor by nature, who, and a contractor who basically nickel and dimes people to death, because that's how they make their money. <laughs> you sure you can't do it for less? I really need it for less, Bill. All oh, right, we'll do it for less. So that gets tiring after a while. And we had a conversation about this. And we agreed that we were going to actually do the third phase by working on the inner self and who we are. And Mark said, yeah, I know, I'm, I'm a control freak. I, gotta, I wanna not be a control freak on this. Well, we, were, we, were, we were, submitted the RFPs to um, the design team. They, um, it was acknowledged that we were gonna be working on developing self along with the building, along with the community. This gets a little, this gets, sounds weird, doesn't it? And, but that was overt in the request for proposals. We had that all set up, we had the first charrette planned, and, and the, it was on a Tuesday, and the Saturday before, I said, oh no, it's stopping again, because I was hearing from the other consultants, Mark is nickel and diming us again. Uh, gotta have a talk with Mark. So, I had permission to do this. So I called up Mark on a Saturday morning and said, Mark, got a problem. What's that, Bill? Oh, the problem is you. <laughs> and, and Mark said, well, that's interesting. What's that mean? He said, I said, well, there's a, I, there's a lack of trust because of this nickel and diming process. And he said, well, Bill, you and I have been working together for 10 years. If there's something with trust here, we got a real problem. So, well, it's just this attitude, and it's, it's a perception. And he said, I get the perception. He said, well, we haven't made explicit. And he was right, because we made this explicit a year, a year before, is that we wanted this building to be an example of how you could do a private school at a public school budget. And I said, you're right. That's what it is about. And I'll, I'll nickel and dime myself to death to achieve that goal. So just as long as we, he said, you know, Bill, you can charge me what you need to charge me, but I need to know why. I said, that's very fair. Now he said, let's talk about you, Bill. <laughs> All's fair, right? He said, what's this trust thing going on? He said, you're telling yourself a story. There's never been anything about trust here. It's been about money. It's been about this objective. So how come you're raising this issue of trust? What's going on with you? Hmm. Well, he was right. He at home. So we had this great talk for about an hour about each of our development and who we, you know, our, our, where we were hitting stumbling blocks and tripping hazards. And we became deeper friends as a result of that conversation. That's developmental and more trusting as a result. Now, we took this into the charrette on Tuesday morning and we started off with the story about what we had been through on Saturday. And that was an amazing experience because that gave people permission to let it all hang out and to get all the 800 pound gorillas off the table or the white elephants off the table or whatever that expression is. So one guy said, I think this is the stupidest charrette I've ever seen. <laughs> And he said, okay, that's a good start. <laughs> and we had an amazing discussion. Do What's we all that? Know what charrette means? Oh, I'm sorry. Charrette, does everybody know what charrette? Who does not know what charrette means? Okay, charrette is a very fast paced workshop uh, where you're making lots of decisions with everybody together, generally. That's what it means. So we had all this design team together. This is a stupid charrette. That was a real motivator, right? So um, we had a great discussion about what we were trying to accomplish and why. And it co coalesced the team. And after two hours, everybody was there, they got it, and they were excited. The point of this is, is that we should not be afraid of making, of being overt about discovering who we are, discovering the building project itself, and discovering the larger system, because it's a whole living system. All right, get that? Okay. At this point, people say, what is this stuff? Let's be practical. Sounds very visionary. Let's be practical. Is that going through anybody's mind? Yes. yes. Somebody said that to one of my colleagues and, and said, um, you know, you're, I'm going to introduce Carol Samper, who's one of my colleagues. I'm going to introduce you. I'm, Carol's talking about all the 
the visionary stuff, kind of impractical stuff. Now we're going to, no, Carol's talking about the visionary, visionary stuff. Now we're going to get practical. And she said, wait a minute. So she stands up and says, let's talk about practical. Is it practical to try to glue thousands of pieces together of the world and make it work? In fact, abstract, what's happening in this play, in this land and in our culture is that we're being entirely impractical. We are actually trying to solve green buildings and sustainability with the same mind that created the problem in the first place. Taking little pieces here and there and solving them. A great, great book or a great chapter to read is Wendell Berry's uh, uh, Gift of Good Land, Chapter 9, on solving for pattern. Because until we start solving for pattern instead of problem solving, we will keep burying ourselves in a hole. This is incredibly practical stuff. What makes it Im seemingly impractical is that we don't know how to do it. And we, want, and, and, we don't, and we don't want to make things hard. But what happens, if you can bust through that paper bag and struggle to make things hard instead of going being on automatic, we, we might actually have a shot at saving this planet. We don't have a whole lot of time. So the idea of, of um, uh, working for years and years and years with little incremental change, yes, it's important, and yes, we have to do it. But if we can take the big leap, we're likely to actually achieve big gains. But we have to, you know, you know there's three basic ways of looking, at, looking at, at our existence in life. We're either on automatic, reactive, or purposeful. And most of us love to be on automatic. I love to be on automatic. I want to get up, take a shower, eat breakfast, go to work, not have any problems, go home, read a book, kiss my wife goodnight, go to bed, repeat. That sounds pretty good, except it gets pretty boring after a while. But automatic is what we're all on. Then we're reactive. I'm in love. I hate you. Road rage, whatever. That's reactive. <laughs> so that's, re that's reactive. And purposeful, I mean, even the, even the great mystics maybe are purposeful 20% of their lives. But if we could be purposeful for 1% or 2% of our lives, we actually have a shot at this. But right now, we're almost on automatic with the Green Building Movement. I don't want to take away from the Green Building Movement. The Green Building Movement is why I'm here today. But I, we also have to wake up from being on automatic. It's just not about counting points. It's looking at life. And that requires a different way of doing it. The biggest leverage points, the biggest leverage points are hope and love, not guilt. Our approach to um, the environment is like this. I'm going to be not really grossly non-politically correct. Sorry. I was listening to David Orr speak, and he was saying, you know, we have to teach the kids how to love life because we aren't going to teach the adults. And I thought, I know how to fall in love. I know how to love. So what's that statement about? And I realized that, well, here's an analogy from this. So I'm going to take, I'm going to take nature, and the nature is a female. I'm going to assume a male-female relationship. Here's nature. She weighs 500 pounds. She's got scoliosis, halitosis, zits. She's unsocialized. Um, she's been sexually and emotionally abused. And in fact, you abused her. And now I want you to take care of her. I want you to be in relationship with her. How's that sound? Does that sound like a good deal? Are you gonna, aren't you going to be running? That's basically the way the environmental movement is portraying nature and life, is that it's a guilt trip. And it's oh, so damaged, and it's so terrible, and it's so scary, and it's so abused, and you abused her, and now we want you to be in a relationship with her. Something doesn't fit with that message, the subliminal role in that message. And then the conservationists are saying, and now we're going to take uh, nature here, and we're going to put her in, her in a closet, and you can visit her twice a year. And then the environmental economists, and, I, and believe me, all this work is really important. I love the conservationists, I love the environmental economists, but the environmental economists are basically saying, and she does great ironing and laundry. She's really worth it. Isn't that what we're saying? We're objectifying life to the point of absurdity. 
And so this work, and now I want to get into the practice of this work. This work, and if you haven't gotten this from the Brattleboro Food Co-op or the Willow School or that project in Iowa, Iowa, this work is helping people to be in relationship with a system we haven't, we've forgotten about. So how do we fall in love? We date somebody. So let's start dating nature. As a design process, I'm serious. And after dating, we get to understand them. And once we understand them, we may fall in love. There's a shot anyway. And that which we are in love with, we take care of. So at the top of that, era, that leverage point is hope. And you know, seeing that we can actually re restore and regenerate life gives me a lot more hope than saying, uh, carbon neutral is OK. Carbon neutral is pretty good. Carbon neutral is really important, but it isn't sufficient. So, oops. Let me talk about now how we need to start looking at life. We have to be working with places, not objects. Now, what's the definition of a place? Here's the paradox. Places are not an object. They're not bounded, and yet they're bounded. When you leave Pittsburgh, what's the, I don't know, going into, um, I'm just trying to think of some nearby towns. You know when you've hit Bellevue, right? You've left Pittsburgh, you've gone into Bellevue. Something shifts. I was in Baltimore, um, when I moved to Baltimore, I, I, was, I, was, I love cities, I walk through cities. Baltimore is a city of neighborhoods. I was trucking through Baltimore, and the identical three-story row houses, two-story row houses with marble stoops, uh, integrated black-white population, looked the same to me. I crossed the street, and I went, whoa, what happened? I'm in a different place. Really. Was that, uh, I asked the guy who the guy was walking down the street, I said, where am I? In Baltimore is a city of neighborhoods. He said, oh, you're in Patterson Park. I said, so where's there? Oh, that's Hyde. I crossed some energetic boundary. Do you know, have you, how many of you have ever had the experience of somebody staring at you and you could feel it? Does that happen to everybody? What's that about? We don't pay attention and take stock of those energetic issues in life, and they're very, very important. So a place is a combination of the geology, the biological life, and the energetic life, the, the consciousness, if you will, that goes on there. Every place is different, and we have to know each place as an organism. And yet there's no boundary, and yet it's bounded. And that's why patterns are really important, because patterns help us define that kind of quality of life. Places have a distinctiveness or essence that identifies them. They are living entities. So as I want to continue on with Vivian, I don't know Vivian, I know what, I can identify what Vivian is. And the way most of us identify and work with our places is we do uh, groundwater hydrology reports and, and animal species and plant species and um, soil, uh, soil microbial counts and uh, what else? All this stuff, right? Anthropological data. And we have a stack of documents five feet high, and we say, there, there's your place. And that's like me saying, Vivian's got a pink uh, jacket on, and she's got brown hair and blue eyes, and she's so tall, and she's so many pounds. Somehow we know that doesn't describe Vivian, nor does it describe a place. What we want to do is we want to understand who that place is. And the way we understand who a place is is just like the way I understand Vivian, who Vivian is. I understand, I want to get to know how she is in relationship to her spouse, her kids, her colleagues, the dog in the street. If I see those relationships, and those relationships are invisible, you have to categorize them with poetry. They're qualitative in nature, but that's the discussion we have when we do people watching. That's what we talk about when we get to know people. It's not their data, but it's who they are in relationship. And it's the same process for getting to know a community. And the way you do this, it must be experienced. And the way we do it is we work with small kitchen table conversations, just like community organizing processes. We don't have gigantic workshops first. We actually get to know how people are working in that place uh, and how they relate to that place. We do historical studies. We do um, uh, how this place evolved, what it was even two and a half million years ago. And we work through with 15 to 20 core groups. And there's always about 15 or 20 core groups in any city or village or New York City or uh, Humboldt, Iowa. There's this core group. And you actually work through those groups and you tr say, not here's a project, what do you think? It's, we want to get to know your home. Can you tell us about it? Wendell Berry said, no one ever called their home an environment. We don't abstract it. We want to get to know what you love or don't love about this place. 
And by doing that, you're actually developing a relationship with them. And then we go back and we pattern it because these places have distinctive patterns. Remember the Idaho example? Uh, it, had, it was a living bridge. That land was a living bridge. That was an essentialized characterization, characterization of, an, of an essential purpose of that place. That's when people start waking up. And once you do that, you come back and you say, well, here's the patterns we're experiencing. What do you think? And people say, no, it doesn't feel right. Or, oh, my goodness, we've never thought about it that way. That is what's going on. And that's when people start waking up. And that's when they start having dialogue. And from those, from those patterns come principles of life in that place. From those principles come indicators. But life must be experienced. It can't be talked about. However, we do have to talk about it. So what do we do? We tell stories. Stories are how, are, how, are how every great civilization held themselves together. Epic poems, song cycles, glyphs on pyramids, oral histories. And they told stories about their past and where they were going in the, in the present and the future. Seventh generation thinking does not mean seven generations into the future. It means three generations in the past, the present generation, and three generations into the future. You cannot tell the future unless you look at the past and how we tra made trajectory through life. And we tell stories about it. What we do is we look at life as a closed system. A closed system is basically uses energy, like an automobile engine. We can map it with arrows. But when we hit an open system, an open system has multiple points of exchange, we still use a closed system mo model. And we end up with diagrams like this. Remember this from about eight months ago in the New York Times? That's the Afghan campaign. Can anybody make sense out of that? But that's like taking a closed system, we're saying, okay, we can map everything in life. No, you can't. It's too complex. And that's why we have to, and so imagine doing an open, a living system as a super open system. Imagine trying to draw arrows in that one. You can in general terms, but not specific terms. So we have to look for qualitative patterns. Now, we're doing this in Mexico City. How do you do this in a mega city? We're doing this from residential properties all the way up to mega cities. But the process is by engaging people in a community around that which they love or care for. So Mexico City has 45 rivers. I don't know how many of you know that. And we take each watershed. We take neighborhoods in each watershed. And we start like with a stone in a pond. And it starts expanding. And we're on our third week-long charrette there now. And it's expanding. And more and more people are attracted. It's not a fast way to do it. But ultimately, you go slow to go fast. This is like sharpening your ax. I'm not going to get into the details of this. Loretto is an interesting story. It's not a successful development, but it is an interesting story. 6,000 units going in the desert. That's the watershed, the pink area. There's the Baja Peninsula. It's a desert, right? It wasn't a desert 400 years ago. In fact, if you go upstream, it's an oasis. And mangrove estuaries down here. The essence pattern of this place is an intelligent membrane. Now, that may not mean anything to you, but it meant something to the people that were there because they knew that estuaries were incredibly important. And out of the estuary, out of this essence, you get, well, here's, you can see there's a, there's a mangrove estuary that had been buried by erosion. All that was an estuary before until the Spanish introduced cattle and row crop agriculture into an area that couldn't handle it. And it turned into a desert within 50 years. Now, the vocation, Jamie Lerner said every city has a vocation. Every great city has a vocation. What's the vocation of this place? The vocation is drawn from these patterns. And the, the exploration of the patterns finally took us three months to figure this out. The vocation for this area is it functions as a, to regenerate the health of the Sea of Cortez. Because the Sea of Cortez is, in, in, you, you test this by how it resonates with people. And if it doesn't feel good to people, it probably isn't right. This is this energetic part. But everybody agreed that this was important. The farmers agreed that it was important. The fishermen, because it's a fishing village, agreed it was important. The, um, the, the tourist industry agreed with, that it was important because if the Sea of Cortez dies, the village dies. So everything, every decision was made to regenerate the Sea of Cortez. So here we are with a development second phase of the development is a new urbanist development. They had cement canals, like it was Venice. I don't quite get the new urbanists, but they do stage set design, I guess. <laughs> and we said, why don't you take those canals and make an estuary out of them? Make, do it what life wants to be there. 
And they thought, well, that seems like a good idea. And so this place turned into a mangrove estuary with every resident taking care of the sweet, white, black, and red mangroves. And what did it do to the property values? Went up. It created a new estuary that hadn't been there for two or 300 years. The, the biologist at Siebdor, the, the quasi-public-private laboratory, one guy was crying because it was so, he said, no one's ever done this scale of ma mangrove restoration, and here's a developer doing it. Who, can, who knew? So it is possible to take life and instead of compromising solutions, actually harmonize and reconcile. That's what integrative design is all about. Taking the time to look and find out how systems work together, and that takes putting people together in a design process to start figuring it out. What we've forgotten about in the Living Building Challenge and in One Planet Living and in LEAD is how we work with life. There's a process of working in life. We're proposing that we need to work with patterns. Somebody else might come up with a better idea. I just wanted to present the possibilities today, and I'm going to skip over these projects. Um, but here's what we have to, here's the final picture for me. We need to discover this one again. And let's take some questions. Thanks.